All right, our scripture readings this morning, uh, we have, do have two of them. So our first one comes from Psalms, uh, chapter one, or 107, uh, verses 1 to 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the land of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And our second reading this morning comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will, in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. So in our scriptures this morning, we get a chance to see what grace means and what it means to us that choose to believe in Jesus Christ and how we are given the greatest gift of all, the grace of God. Now in the scripture in John, it's important to get a little bit of background here on who Jesus was speaking to at the time. You see, Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a Pharisee so he was a high-ranking Jewish leader that understood his faith through the idea of being a strict adherent to the law of Moses. Now, when we discuss the Pharisees in the Christian church, we often view them as being bad people. And they can be cast in this light that shows them as adversaries to Jesus and his message. It's generally how we discuss the Pharisees when we think about them. But, if we consider things from their side, from their traditions, the truth is that they are trying to worship God in a way that they thought was best. See, they were people that were deeply committed to trying to live their lives according to what they thought God wanted from them. And truly, until Jesus came as the Messiah, they were probably doing what God required of them. They were following those laws as strictly as possible. But the problem for them starts when they reject Jesus as the Messiah. So now we see that the Pharisees are trying to live their lives in this strict accordance to the law, and we see them condemning themselves and condemning others when they fail to follow that law perfectly. And you see, the problem for them and the problem for people that try to live their lives this way is that they're playing a game that is rigged for them to fail. There's probably no truer saying than this. Nobody is perfect. Now, I have known some pretty wonderful people throughout my life I have known some people that were very good and godly people that I would hold up to you as great examples of Christian, Christians living their lives the way they should. But I can honestly say this, I have never known anyone that is perfect. So if your faith, if your salvation is based on trying to be perfect, you can see that that's a rigged game and you are doomed to fail. Have you ever found yourself playing a game that you know you're going to lose 
even before you start. Our family likes to go on vacation every year to Rehoboth Beach, and it's a wonderful tradition that we all look forward to every year. And in Rehoboth Beach, there's a place called Funland. Maybe if you've been to Rehoboth, you know about Funland. But if not, Funland has all sorts of rides and games that you can play. And each year on vacation, I go and I try to win the ring toss game. And maybe you've seen the ring toss game in other places, but if you're not familiar, the ring toss game works like this. There's a bunch of glass bottles, and you have to try to throw a hard plastic ring onto those glass bottles. And the ring is just large enough so that, in theory, it will go on top of that bottle. And I have spent the last 15 years of my life and countless attempts trying to throw that ring onto that bottle. And I have never, not one single time, landed the ring on the bottle. And it has gotten to the point where it's a running joke in my family that they can't believe that I keep trying to get the bottle, the ring on the bottle. You see, trying to live your life perfectly is just like the ring game. It's something that in theory could be achieved. But in practice, is so difficult that no person will ever accomplish it. So then what are we to do? Well, the good news is we don't have to worry about being perfect. If we accept Jesus as our savior, you see, the price for our sins has already been paid. Our debt is covered by the grace that God gives us through Jesus Christ. So this is what winning the ring toss game looks like when you have the grace of God. And so I'm going to show you this morning. When you have the grace of God, that's how hard it is to win the ring game. And I'll expect my giant stuffed animal when I walk out today. <laughs> See, once we have accepted that gift of God's grace in our lives, there is no way for us to lose this game. The only way, there is one way, the only way for us to lose that game once we've accepted the grace of God will be for us to do this. I've accepted the grace of God and I throw it away. That is the only way that we lose from that point on. But here's the awesome news as well. Even when you have failed, even when you've accepted his grace and you've backslid your way away from that grace, if you are willing to humble yourself, confess and repent of your sins, God is willing to give you another chance again. And if you don't believe me, I encourage you to spend some time reading the Old Testament and see how many times the Israelites have turned away from God and how many times God has forgiven them. And so, brothers and sisters, when we have the grace of God in our lives, we know that we already have won that gift of salvation. But it is important for us to know this. When we are given that grace of God through Jesus' sacrifice, it's not a free pass to live our lives in any way that we want. We cannot begin to live our lives in a way that wouldn't please God. And indeed, there were people that were early Christians that believed the more that you sinned, the better Christian you were. Because the more sins you committed, the more grace God gave you. And you may hear it expressed by some people today in this way. Well, if I don't sin, then Jesus died for nothing. And that is simply not the case. <laughs> See, we are still called to live obedient lives. We are called to serve God. We are still ca called to do our utmost to uphold his laws. But the difference for us and for the Pharisees is that we are not condemned when we fail. So what did John Wesley have to say about this type of grace? Well, this is what John Wesley would have called sanctifying grace. The grace that we receive from God when we believe, he called that justifying grace. 
Well, Wesley described the difference between the two this way. The one he wrote of justifying grace implies what God does for us through the Son. The other, sanctifying grace, is what God works in us through the Spirit. So when it comes to sanctifying grace, we are to show the great works of God that he is doing through us. We are to do this by living our lives in ways that are keeping with the teachings of Jesus. And we work towards sanctifying grace every day, knowing that the process never ends. We can think of it this way. We are always under construction, just like the roads in Pennsylvania. But we are always working in, towards growing our faith. And we do this by the means of grace. And the United Methodist Church understands the means of grace in four basic categories. Acts of worship, devotion, justice, and compassion. Our acts of worship are things like going to church and receiving the sacrament of communion. Our acts of devotion, the private times of worship, including things like our private prayer and our Bible studies. Our acts of justice, working towards things in our neighbor, neighborhoods, uh, things like eliminating racism and advocating for the poor and the marginalized. And our acts of compassion, reaching out to our neighbors in need and telling them that they have a friend in us and a friend in God that love them. And so we are to do everything we can, wherever we can, whenever we can, to continue working on our sanctifying grace. And in closing today, I want to leave you with this thought about the grace of God. One saying that I love, and I think all Christians should commit to memory, especially when you're being told you're a hypocrite because you fail. It is this saying, I am not perfect, I am just forgiven. Because that is the truth for all of us. None of us are perfect, and there will be times when we fail. But if we confess and repent of our sins, when, then we are forgiven. Because the grace that God has shown us through his son. So my challenges for you this week are these. Have you accepted the grace of Jesus Christ into your life? And if not, I'd sure like to talk to you more about it. And if you have, what is one step that you can do this week to show God that you're working towards your sanctifying grace? Amen.